And I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, before we get started, I just really quickly want to go over some general housekeeping information. Um, this session is being recorded, and we will get you the link to the recording usually within a couple days. And what's great about the recording is you can go back and view any information you want to take a look at again, or have, have other members of your organization take a look if you like. Um, if you are having any technical issues at all, please feel free to use the chat box over on the left-hand side of your screen. Just click that attendee chat button over the emojis. I'll be happy to help you out there. As I've mentioned, your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with distraction from background noise when we get a number of people on the phone at the same time. Um, but again, you've got that chat where you're, if you're having technical issues, you can type in questions there. If you should be having trouble hearing us at all and you're on the computer, you may want to try to call in on your phone. So sometimes just depending on bandwidth and speed and weather, it may speed up or slow down your internet, and that may affect the audio sometimes. So that's just another option that you might have. And you can switch to your phone. It will give you the number if you look at those icons over the top of your screen, over the slides. Again, if you have any trouble, please let me know in the chat. Also, please, if you have questions during the presentation for our presenter, Feel free to type those into the chat box as you think about them. I will periodically pass questions along to Eileen. If we don't get to your question right away, um, please don't worry about that. I've made a note and we'll try to get to it at the end of the presentation. But I'd like you to know to please feel free to type them in as you have that. So again, I just want to mention one more time for anybody that might have just joined us. The attendee chat is on the left-hand side of your screen. You just click the attendee chat tab right over the emojis. And um, you can type in any questions you have, either for the presenter or if you're having technical issues. So it is now my pleasure to go ahead and introduce your presenter for today. Eileen Castell is a licensed professional counselor who has over 16 years combined academic, professional training, providing counseling, and supervising clinicians in the field. She has a wide um, array of experience and education. Um, and her animal welfare background includes being vegan. She's a board member of Elephant Care Unchained, a member of Chicago Circus Protest and Chicago Alliance for Animals. She's currently an intern at Caring Center for Studying Trans Species Psychology. Eileen, I'm going to now pass this over to you. Great. Thank you. Um, if there is back Hi, if there is background noise just for a moment, my computer, it kicks on and off, so um, it should be kicking off here in a moment. So I apologize if there's any temporary um, noise in the background. So hi, thank you all for joining. I'm really glad to be here. Um, this was a topic that was really requested um, by a lot of the Global Factory um, affiliates. So hopefully um, feel free to pass around this webinar when you do receive it to others that this may have be that this might be of interest to. So um, so I'm going to talk today obviously about conflict resolution and skills for healthy relationships, teams, and organizations. So the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. So we become uh, either great at avoiding conflict or difficult conversations, or we just aren't handling them too well. Some examples might be that coworkers email instead of talking person to person, friends send texts maybe instead of calling, and perhaps family change the subject when topics get uncomfortable. So essentially, we, we fear, I think, that we have to choose between telling the truth and upsetting someone or suffering in silence. So I want you guys to just take a moment and self-reflect a little bit on your own experiences currently going on. What are some key sources of conflict in your workplace? And if not in your workplace, of course, you can think about uh, something in a personal relationship. So are there things that you're not addressing at work or where you volunteer? When do these conflicts tend to occur? 
How do people respond to these conflicts as they arise? When you solve problems, do you do so for the moment? Or do you put sy systems in place for addressing these types of concerns in the future? So let me give you an example of some potential issues. Let's say your workday is very long, but you stay each day to get everything done and other staff members may not. There might be resentment that develops or frustration that others don't care as much about the animals or the organization as you do. And so it can be really challenging if you or only a few others meet all of the needs of the animals and the facility. So likely creating, of course, frustration and disappointment to see perhaps other staff members or even volunteers not completing maybe all of their tasks before they leave for the day. So again, most of us avoid these uncomfortable conversations because we assume that we have to tell the truth and then upset someone or keep the peace. And you know, this can be especially be true with someone who is higher up in the chain of command for us or has a more authoritative role. So for example, wanting perhaps to inform the veterinarian how a particular bird prefers to be held or that they need to approach a particular horse more slowly than they are we we quite often don't don't want to offend or be disrespectful. So, um, it, you know, another example might be maybe you are a volunteer and there's something going on with a staff member in terms of how they're caring for an animal or maybe um, not adhering to the veterinarian's advice and you don't really know what to do in terms of speaking up because you're a volunteer. So just a quick outline for today and what we'll cover, how we learn to manage conflict, reactions to conflict, causes for it, particularities for nonprofit, Hi, Robin, was that you just Hi. speaking there? Um, I think, let me I actually, Oh, I thought okay, you were trying, you try to trying to something with me and it was. No, I think we're getting some background noise. It's OK. We're good now. Not for you, oh, though, okay. we're good. OK, sorry. I <laughs> um, okay. wanted to make sure you guys could hear me. So, OK, so moving on, we'll then talk about the benefits of conflict, um, four critical parts of communication, types of conflict styles. And then, of course, we need to touch on aggressive communication and then repairing safety and then persuasion. So one of the, well, let's start at the top. You know, I'll focus on the learn and practice behavior. A lot of this we learn from our family dynamics growing up in our households, how to address conflict, how to resolve conflict. That might not always be the most adaptive or healthiest way that we particularly have learned. Um, but we can also, of course, learn new skills and practice those new behaviors. We can remain focused on our goal and stay on task. So this is a part of learning how to manage conflict is to stay on task. And I'll talk more about this later. We need to learn how to tap into empathy, concern, or consideration for others when we're having a conflict. Um, oftentimes we stay too focused on, on our needs and, and we're not looking at the bigger picture of how maybe our conversations are landing on the other person. An ability to self-regulate emotions in the moment which is essentially just being able to cope with the emotional reactions that are coming up within you and still being able to carry and conduct yourself in a professional, um, perhaps compassionate manner. And then, and then boundary setting. So I think boundary setting um, is one of the more difficult things. Uh, we basically, boundary setting is if you think about what you can tolerate and accept and what makes you feel uncomfortable or stressed, those help us identify what our limits are. So I think having barriers and setting good boundaries is one of the biggest barriers to actually speaking up. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult to maintain your personal boundaries or the boundaries of the nonprofit while still being able to be assertive yet gentle, kind, and honest in your communication. And again, I don't know that how to be assertive as well as compassionate and kind 
and perhaps loving in our communication when, when we need to be. Okay, so there are three reactions, emotional, cognitive, and physical, that happen to us when we're anticipating conflict or engaging in one. The emotional response are all the feelings you feel. It could be anger, fear, despair, confusion. Cognitive responses, these are our ideas and thoughts about conflict, such as conflict is bad, nothing's going to change, why speak up anyways, they'll be upset with me if I say anything. The physical responses, we move into fight or flight mode. So this happens when our capacity to, to problem solve, reason, and logically think decreases. So once um, our heart rates speed up and we get um, uh, you know, that adrenaline rush, our thinking abilities really do go down because our bodies are preparing for a fight or flight response. So, um, so basically we are going into a self-protective mode when we are moving into a fight or flight response, which um, can cause many of us to shake or raise our voices or say things that we don't necessarily mean. So this is when coping must come into play. For the purpose of this webinar, we don't really have time to talk about coping skills um, or self-regulating your emotions. So if you if you would like to check out my first webinar on compassion fatigue, uh, there, there is some information there on, on coping. So we do need to talk about the four types of conflict. The intrapersonal conflict occurs within ourselves, and this can take place in our mind, involving our thoughts, our values, our principles, our emotions, and it can vary in degree. It could be as simple as, do I eat organic for lunch or something larger that has a maybe a bigger effect, which might be figuring out and choosing whether your facility can manage taking on or affording another animal. So it's quite possible that these interpersonal conflicts can cause a number of reactions like uneasiness, restlessness, sadness, anxiety. So a lot of times it's letting, um, letting someone else you know, in on what you're experiencing and communicating with other people about this. So interpersonal conflict refers to a conflict between two individuals. So this occurs typically due to how people are different from one another. We all have different, of course, personalities, which usually results in differences in choices and opinions. And this is a very natural thing that occurs. Um, and this hopefully will, once you work through this, lead to personal growth and developing your relationships with others. Um, it's gonna be very hard to go our lives without having interpersonal uh, difficulties in our personal lives as well as at work. So intra-group conflict is among individuals within a team. So again, this is stemming from misunderstandings, incompatibility, differences in personalities between two individuals within an organization. So in order to have intra-group conflict, you have to have interpersonal conflict within that group. So a uh, pro of this really can be that it can help come up with like new decisions and new problems for and, and kind of moving maybe the organization or different policies and procedures forwards. However, if a degree of conflict is too large, it can disrupt harmony within within the members. So lastly is is intergroup conflict. And this takes place when there is differences between different teams in an organization. So for example, the, uh, a board member of an organization can have conflicting feelings with management and staff, maybe about strategic plans to expand the nonprofit facility, as an example. So, we are going to, here, here listed are nine types of causes for conflict. So as I go through them, maybe you can think about your own facility. So there um, are definitely, I'll start at the top, communication problems, task interdependence, con conflicting roles, conflicting resources, incorrect perceptions and assumptions, conflicting pressures, and perhaps timelines with that, organizational structure, naturally differences in personality and values, and limited resources. So how does conflict differ with nonprofits? So 
conflict in nonprofits um, is a bit unique in some in some senses. We know nonprofits and you guys don't operate to turn profits, but it is an integral part of the nonprofit world. So, you know, success in fundraising and participation in programs often depends on non-salaried volunteers. So then, you know, within that, the organization and the direction of these volunteers is primarily, you know, falls on the role of the staff. So roles, confusion about roles and responsibilities can lead to conflicts um, over who is accountable for what. So an example might be dual roles of a board member who is also a volunteer. So it's really important to get the roles and job descriptions down. I'll say a little bit more on that in a bit. In terms of conflict management, they're really, oftentimes nonprofits don't have a lot of training um, or manuals around this type of um, entity, which really is important. So obviously the interaction between staff and the volunteers needs to function smoothly for a nonprofit to be successful. So conflicts between the staff you know, or between the volunteers will interfere with your, your organization's short and long-term goals naturally. So um, you know, if, for example, a volunteer becomes upset with a salaried staff member or a volunteer, again, handling this situation can be really difficult because the volunteers are so needed, right? So do you fire a volunteer? You know, it's a really hard question. So conflict management training does need to be a subject of high attention for, for everyone interested in the success of, of your nonprofit. So it's advisable that your organization does engage in really careful and thoughtful recruitment, selection and training of staff and volunteers, and then also creating a thorough manual for individuals to follow and be able to look back and review. Within that being said, job descriptions can be unclear with inner, you know, with with um, obligations kind of overlapping. So job descriptions should be clear and updated. And, um, you know, new leadership, especially with new board members coming in, can also disorient, disorient kind of the system as a whole. So really laying some ground rules out with some manuals can be very helpful. Let's see if there's anything else. Um, no, I think that's that's about it. We can we can move on. So we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of conflict. I was going to say a lot more on each of these topics, but due to time, I, I, I want to be thoughtful. So I'll just go through and read these with you. Um, I think when we're about to approach conflict, we are you know, full of maybe discomfort or different emotions, and we forget to think about the benefits of conflict, whether it's in your personal relationships or in, in your organization. So benefits of conflict include, it can open our eyes to new ideas, which is always great for uh, nonprofits who are always needing to evolve and grow and change and find solutions and, and transition. So no matter what, how we try to avoid conflict, it will always be a regular part of our personal and professional lives. So we need to expose ourselves to these things and try to improve the way we handle it. So another conflict can be, I'm sorry, another benefit is an opportunity to verbalize our needs, increase flexibility, uh, increase trust and resiliency in relationships. It really does become strengthened after the, the conflict is resolved. We have a newfound trust um, and level of intimacy with people. It improves listening and communication skills, improved emotion regulation, so the ability to manage your different emotions as they come up. Um, it teaches us how others handle stress or conflict, which is really important in building rapport and relationships with others. And it helps us lead to solutions and also helps us set limits and boundaries as well as know what our own limits and boundaries are. So surprisingly, um, 93% of our meaning of messages comes from nonverbal sources. The exact percentages I don't think really matter. What does is knowing nonverbal behavior is the most crucial aspect of communication. So we need to be really thoughtful about our tone of voice and our facial expressions and our physical nonverbals, like our body posture, leaning in, making eye contact, things like that.
Okay, so I'm going to talk about the what I consider to be the four most important factors for communication. And first and foremost, we need to be in the right frame of mind. I like the little cartoon to the right, which says, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. So we really do need to be in the right frame of mind. We need to be calm. We need to be centered. And perhaps you've even planned out what we might want to say. So knowing your goal and your motives and to never distract. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about what not to do. Don't get distracted by the details or a play-by-play -play of what happened. I think we can all imagine maybe arguments we've had with our significant others when we go down that road. You know, rehashing the play-by-play -play details shifts you into a space of who is right and who is wrong, and it just ends up a power struggle. And you guys have then lost the bigger picture, and you've lost the bigger picture in terms of what you're really trying to resolve, which might be respect attention to detail, more empathy, or better time management, for example. So that's kind of the first thing to, to be thoughtful of, not to get involved and lost in the details, stay bigger picture. Secondly, be thoughtful about not punishing others. Sometimes, you know, we do get hurt or angry, and sometimes we do want to get back at the other person, which might look like shaming, mocking, silent treatment, name calling, or um, discrediting feelings. So you want to avoid conversations um, that engage in that type of, of behavior. And then finally, you want to be thoughtful about shifting into peacekeeping. There might be occasions where you'll, you'll definitely want to pick your battles and let things go. But you also need to be sure that you're not doing this simply to avoid conflict all the time. So peacekeeping is when people feel fear, nervousness, or anxiety. And we want to avoid or decrease these feelings. Um, so sometimes we choose personal safety to avoid that. So some of this can look like sugarcoating, avoiding conversations or agreeing when you don't. So again, just check in with yourself and be thoughtful. Again, sometimes picking your battles is important, but if you're always peacekeeping just to avoid the discomfort of conflict, that's not going to be a good avenue. So what you should do um, it, to keep your goal in your mind while you're having difficult discussions is ask yourself what happened to my goal. Usually we lose sight of our goal in a, in a, in a quick single instant moment that we might not even notice. So you might want to ask yourself, am I changing my goal to save face? Am I trying to avoid embarrassment? Do I want to be right? Am I avoiding vulnerability, such as apologizing? Apologizing and vulnerability go hand in hand. Um, or am I trying to put other people in their place to hurt them? And so you might want to ask yourself if you're getting lost in your discussions. The other things you can ask yourself is, what do I really want? What do I want for this person or organization? What do I want for this relationship? Um, you can ask yourself an and question. And an and question sounds like, how can I be honest? and compassionate, kind, or loving during this conversation. You might need a moment of silence during a discussion or a conversation to take a breath, calm yourself, or gather your thoughts, and that's perfectly okay. Um, you might also even decide in that moment that you need to step away from the conversation and reschedule it, which is also fine. You know, I think a good way to know and do a self check in with this also is: Am I am I behaving in a way that I feel proud of, or would I feel comfortable if others could actually listen in and and see this? The biggest communication problem is that we um, do not listen to understand; we listen to reply. So the third most component, the, sorry, the third most important component of communication, I believe, is um, listening. And confirmation bias is a tendency to pick out facts or aspects of a conversation that support our pre-existing beliefs or values. So the effects get stronger when we're emotionally charged about an issue. 
or something that we hold deep to deep and precious to us. So just as an example of confirmation bias is, you know, like during a political election, we tend to focus on the positive things about our candidate that we support and that match our interests. And we ignore or play out, or play down kind of the bad components. So a lot of times in discussions, we are functioning from a place of confirmation bias where we want to hear or we focus in or remember the facts that um, align with what we believe. So exam for example, if we believe someone is selfish and we're having a conversation with them or, or a discussion, anytime we hear them say something that might be selfish, that's going to stand out to us. So confirmation bias does lead to competitive listening, which is we hear things and have a negative reaction because we believe the other person is wrong. So when that happens, we stop listening and the communication breaks down. And during that time, we either then shift into just listening for a quick opening so we can jump in, or we're trying to look for flaws or weak points for the other person to say. So we're basically pretending that we're paying attention and we're just basic, patiently waiting for an opening to jump in. So this is an example of confirmation bias, the little cartoon. Granted, we both remember it, but the funny thing is that we remember it very differently. So we'll talk about each of these six. These are extremely important in resolving conflict, negotiating, being assertive, able to communicate in a way where both parties feel safe. And the safer both parties feel, the more likely you are going to get resolution. So we'll start with encouraging. What's the slide? There we go. Encouraging sounds like, can you tell me more? It's to convey interest, to encourage the other person to keep talking and sharing. You don't have to agree or disagree to use encouraging skills. You can use neutral words that don't convey agreement or disagreement, such as, thank you for sharing. I'd love to better understand what you're experiencing. The next is clarifying. That sounds like something like, when did this happen? So to, this is really used to get more information to help the person see other points of view. So when clarifying, you're asking questions just to gather more information. You can also use this skill to restate a wrong interpretation or to force the speaker to explain further. So this is really actually a nice, um, a nice way because you don't have to call the other person out if you don't agree or if they're saying something incorrectly while you're probing and, and per asking for further clarification and they're having to elaborate, they may see that their perspective really doesn't make sense or is wrong or, or really doesn't work. So some other examples of clarifying would be um, rather than someone, rather than if someone says there's not enough time in the day and you say, yeah, there is, or, uh, you know, you might then instead say rather than disagreeing with them instead you can say what do you mean by there's not enough time in the day and that will cause the other person to self-reflect and elaborate uh, another another example might be if someone says uh, there's plenty of funds we can definitely we can definitely take on another animal in our organization and you disagree rather than saying no we don't have enough funds what you can say is, when you say there are plenty of funds, what does that mean? Um, another option for clarifying would be saying something like, on one hand, you're saying X, but on the other hand, you're saying Y, can you help me better understand? Reflecting, here you want to restate the person's basic feelings. And so you're going to use feeling words like you seem angry. Can I can tell this is overwhelming for you. This shows you understand how the person feels. And once somebody feels understood, they soften. Um, this also helps the person evaluate their own feelings after hearing them, you know, reflected back to them. So, you know, someone might not actually say something like I'm so sad, but you might be able to refer that infer that from their nonverbal, such as maybe they're being tearful or kind of mopey, and you can self, you can reflect that back to them and say, oh, you know, it, 
I, it seems like you're really sad about this topic. Summarizing is restating major ideas, including emotions. So this is probably one that many of you are very familiar with. An example might be, seems like you're concerned about our wolf pepper and her safety transitioning to our facility. Or um, I think you're sharing that you believe our elderly horse justice isn't getting the proper medical care. So we do this basically to review progress, pull important facts and ideas together, and to establish a basis for further discussion. Um, again, with summarizing, we're listening for the big picture. We're not getting caught up in the details. So if you're speaking with someone that's just giving you the play-by-play, -play, then you can shift the conversation to the bigger picture and um, focus on that by using summarizing. The last two are restating and validating. So um, restating is, is kind of restating something that's more specific. So it's a little bit different than reflecting. Reflecting is reflecting someone's emotions where restating is um, and summarizing is more a large idea or large points that you're reflecting back. But restating is something that's a bit more specific in the discussion. So something example might be, so you'd like to be less involved in training and managing volunteers. So this shows your listening and understanding, which helps the other person sit and feel at ease. And you also are using this to check the meaning and interpretation. So it helps you kind of know that you're understanding what the other person is sharing with you. And then lastly, we have validating. So that sounds like, I appreciate your willingness to work through this. Um, I know we have differences of opinions and I'm, I'm really grateful you're interested in talking through this. So we do this to acknowledge the worthiness of the other person. We do this to acknowledge acknowledge value in their concerns, issues, or or their feelings. And it helps us show appreciation for their for their efforts and their their actions. So the last the last one that I think is a, the fourth one that's really important for uh, critical conversations is engaging in accurate, reliable, you know, and of course honest information. So plan when to meet to discuss an issue. You know, sometimes people need preparation versus you preparing and then just approaching somebody, but actually the two of you planning when to sit down and discuss something. This shows respect and it allows both parties to uh, plan and get organized. So feel free for yourself to prepare ahead of your main points that you'd like to cover or your top goal. So stay focused on tasks. Consider how to frame your, your communication. Um, this is really important. You want to make sure, again, that it's assertive, but it's both honest and kind and gentle. So while exchanging facts, um, again, don't get caught up in too much details. And <clears throat> you also want to be thoughtful about those that might have a different personality or culture from you. Um, so you'll need to be thoughtful about your boundaries with this and how to approach the conversation. You know, for example, like one, one person might feel that challenging someone's opinion is a perfectly healthy way of communicating where another person might feel this is disrespectful and tense. So you do want to take into account someone else's culture or personality before you approach them. So this is just a little graph. I'm going to talk about each one of these types of conflict approaches. Uh, we will talk about avoiding um, competing, accommodating, compromising, and collaboration. I just wanted to show you this nice little graph to help you kind of get a visual of types of cooperation and level of competitiveness. I include this on the next couple of slides as well. So it's likely that any one of us can employ um, more than one of these conflict styles, depending on the situation. But usually one we have one style that dominates. And certain styles might be more appropriate for certain situations. So, um, you know, the avoidance, I'll talk about the benefits and the cons, reduces initial conflict, which is, you know, that can feel great. 
It resolves short-term issues that might pass with time. <clears throat> but the cons are, um, it, it may not actually address the conflict and it can create tension and stress at work and influence work productivity. Um, uh, competing, so competition. This also might complete short and long-term goals faster, but a con is that there's usually one person that's not feeling heard or who may walk away feeling dismissed, angry, or frustrated. And of course, someone in your on your staff or volunteer team that feels this way, of course, it's going to impact work productivity as well or create an unhealthy working environment. Accommodation. So this quickly resolves conflict and does get things done. So one person is accommodating the other. Um, so the one person that is accommodating might feel like they've really helped. But the con is, is that this might not be the right solution. It might not lead to the needs of the organization or um, other needs might be unmet for the individual. Uh, the other problem that can happen with this is that the relationship might be taking precedence over the animals or the nonprofit's mission. So the last two that we will cover is compromising and collaborating. So compromising can, can be seen as fair on both parties, which can be nice, and it does resolve short-term goals. <clears throat> A con is that neither party is 100% happy. And then the conflict might reoccur later. Collaboration is probably the best win-win situation, and it is effective in both solving short-term and long-term solutions. Just one of the cons with collaboration is, is it does take time, and that's, I think, one thing that nonprofits don't have a lot of. So if you would like to figure out what your style is under stress, or maybe new hires as they're going through training or new volunteers, they, you can go to this link, the crucialconversations.com link, and there is an assessment there that you can take. This website also has more information on um, discussion questions and other webinars and um, other things related to conflict management and resolution. So we're going to spend some time on aggressive communication. I like this little cartoon, um, a dung beetle argument. I'll let you guys read the bottom line. So there will be times when we're trying to resolve conflict with someone that is pretty verbally intimidating or aggressive. So some of these tactics that people use might be controlling, labeling, or attacking. I'm going to talk about these um, and then ask you guys to do your own check-ins on these things. So, um, you know, controlling is convincing others of your view or dominating the conversation. So examples might be cutting others off, overstating facts, speaking on absolutes, which is words like should, always, must, never, and then changing subjects. So do a check-in and ask yourself, in order um, for you to get your point across, do you sometimes exaggerate your side of the argument? Do you cut people off? Do you change the subject in order to bring it back to where you think it should be? The second is labeling, um, labeling people's ideas in order to dismiss them. So some examples, some examples might be, do you sometimes let people know when they've said something stupid, like that was stupid or that doesn't make sense? Um, I guess, again, it, you know, if you say that doesn't make sense, that's also going to depend a lot on your nonverbals and your tone on how that comes across. Uh, when you're surprised by a comment, do you say things like, give me a break, or that's ridiculous? 
attacking is not, you know, self-explanatory, hurting the other person. Um, an example might be try that again and you'll see what happens. Or um, if that happens one more time, that'll be it. Check in. So if you get, if you personally get in a heated discussion at work or in your personal relationships, are you known to be tough on the other person? Um, in fact, does the other person feel a bit insulted or hurt? So verbal aggression is really just attempts to control or compel others to your point of view. That's all it is. This usually means that the other person doesn't feel safe. So if somebody's getting aggressive with you or defensive, um, they are usually not feeling safe. So this is where you're tapping into empathy. You're tapping into empathy going, oh my gosh, even those persons coming at me and they're attacking me and I feel really uncomfortable and I want to go into fight or flight mode, you know, kind of recognizing that they don't feel safe. Um, you'll, so you'll want to watch for this moment in a conversation and when it turns, which is going to be a very quick moment perhaps at times. And you'll know this moment when someone starts to get defensive, flippant, louder, or their nonverbals get more aggressive. So take a moment to maybe um, consider what triggered it. So anytime someone, again, is defensive or aggressive, it's because there's something they don't feel safe about. So it's your job. If you want to get resolution, it's your job to make the other person feel safe. And that might feel unfair. But at the end of the day, if you're wanting to get resolution, you have to make the other person feel safe. That is now your job. So use your listening guidelines that we talked about a little bit earlier and be thoughtful about your tone and your nonverbals and utilize softer ones like, you know, softening your eye contact, leaning forward, slowing your movements, softening your tone. So if you're the one that happens to get defensive or louder or more aggressive, then you'll probably need to think about what it was that triggered you. Usually if something triggers you, it's probably possible that in any other context, that same thing will trigger you. So, um, was it is it fear that 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 you won't be heard that tends to get you feeling more defensive or aggressive um, or someone feeling like they're not understanding your idea? Do you feel like you're being talked down to? Does that does that trigger you? Um, are you being dismissed? Does being dismissed make you feel triggered? So is the other party, oh, sorry, another example um, might be like, is the other party having trouble admitting that they're wrong? Does that trigger you? Um, are you? Are they being submissive to avoid the conflict or shaming or belittling your perspective? So it's always great to self-reflect and know what triggers you so that when you see it happening in a conversation that you can then go into kind of going, okay, someone's not feeling safe here, including myself. Um, if they're attacking me or belittling my ideas, they might not feel safe. And how do we neutralize this conversation? So before going into a discussion, spend time self-reflecting on these types of questions. Um, and I think another thing, I know we're talking about aggressive verbal aggression, but you should also know that if someone is getting quieter or begins to maybe withdraw or become more passive during a conversation that this too probably means that they're they're not feeling safe so again it, it's up to you to use your listening guidelines and um, soften your nonverbals. so repairing safety so <clears throat> once somebody doesn't feel safe in a conversation in order to get back to doing the work that needs to be done you got to repair the safety. So apologizing might be a big part of this. Sometimes we do have to give up saving face or being right, winning the argument or even our pride. But the, the apology has to be sincere in order for safety to be repaired. You know, within this being said, sometimes we hurt people without even meaning to or even knowing. So the injury may have been completely unintentional. And this is when uh, contrasting skill can be used. So this is used to address um, and clarify what you didn't mean to do and then state what you do think and feel. This shows respect for the other party. So I'll give you an example. 
Um, when talking with a volunteer, using the example from earlier, when talking to the volunteer that leaves early or doesn't complete tasks, the volunteer might feel hurt and believe that you no want them, that you no longer want them working at your organization. So then you might use this um, contrasting by saying something like, the last thing I wanted to do was communicate that I don't value your work or contributions or that I don't want you volunteering here. I think your contributions and help are extremely important to me, the animals and this organization. And so once safety is restored, you can return to your goal. So in this example with the volunteer, you might then say, as you return to your goal, this is why it's so needed and important that you're able to be here and help with the items assigned to you. Um, so I wanna give a little disclaimer about contrasting is, contrasting is, is not a way of taking back an important message that you need to discuss with somebody. So it's not about backpedaling. Um, the, the volunteer obviously needs to complete the tasks that are given to him or her. So contrasting, though, is a way of making sure someone doesn't exaggerate what you're saying to them and be more hurt than needed. OK, so another way to repair safety is reset and create a mutual purpose. Verbalize your interest in finding a mutually agreeable solution. So when two people are at an impasse, it's because we're asking one thing of the other person that, um, and the other person is asking for something else, so we're not aligned. So find out why the other person wants what they want or doesn't want um, something that you're, you're trying to negotiate. So for example, um, speaking to a volunteer, I noticed you left early volunteering during the fundraiser. And the volunteer might say, I, I left the fundraiser because walking around asking people for donations was uncomfortable and I, I really didn't want to do it. And the employee says, well, do you think you would have stayed longer if you had a different role the day of the event, like setting up, greeting guests, passing out water, you know, breaking down at the end of the event? Or you might say, I can understand that was uncomfortable. Maybe we can sit down and talk about why it's uncomfortable and I can give you some training on how better to navigate asking for donations in the future. So basically, the main goal for this discussion may have been for the volunteer to commit to what they agree to do. And so, you know, again, you need to make sure that they feel safe during the entire discussion. Okay, so a few additional skills. Mind, uh, mind reading which we all naturally do and it's okay. We wanna be thoughtful about whether we assume and make assumptions about the other person's thoughts, feelings, or motives. So we, we, that's one, one thing. The second additional set, um, skill set is to use open-ended questions. Close-ended questions are those that <clears throat> will end with a one word response, like yes, no, I don't know, yesterday. So examples of open and closed-ended questions um, don't say something like, "Do you did you actually see him do it? Versus saying, what was your understanding of the situation? So another example would be, were you angry? That would end up in a yes or no answer versus how do you feel about that? Third, use I statements instead of you statements. So example, don't say you make me feel mad or why don't you listen? Instead, you want to say something like, I feel like I'm not being understood, so I feel dismissed or I feel unheard. Can we talk? Lastly, absolute qualifiers are words as like always, never, should, all or none. Example, she always lays their food on the ground. She never uses enrichment techniques for feeding. So when we use absolute qualifiers, it, it usually puts the other person on the defense and they just want to refute what you're saying. Setting ground rules can be something to do if you're wanting to do a more formal discussion or if there are more if there's a few parties involved, a few people involved in the discussion. So these are just examples of ground rules. Something like one person speaks at a time, 
who are committed to listening to one another to understand the other person's point of view before responding. What we discuss will be kept in confidence unless there is an agreement regarding who needs to know further. We agree to talk directly with the person with whom there are concerns and not seek to involve others in gossip or alliance building. We agree to try our hardest and trust that others are doing the same within the group. We will support the expression of differences in a harassment-free workplace, and we agree to attack the issues, not the people whom we disagree. So I'm going to just check the time. Okay, so I'm going to go through these types of communication styles um, for persuasion. So this section can be used for uh, conflict resolution, dealing with the public who might have different views than you, uh, related to animal welfare, or even things to think about for marketing purposes. All right, so priming, it might be, priming is a little difficult to explain, but um, it's an attempt to activate a certain schema or mindset that we have. So it's basically how we form memories and link words, ideas, or objects together. So for example, um, you know, a person who sees the word yellow will be slightly faster to recognize the word banana. And this is because yellow and banana are closely associated in memory. So seeing the word yellow primes us for thinking about bananas. So we can prime someone's thoughts or behaviors. So for example, in a research study, participants were exposed to words such as bingo, wise, retired, and Florida. All of these relate to the elderly. When participants left the room, those that were exposed to the priming for elderly actually left the room significantly slower than the control group. Um, uh, the author of How to Use Psychology to Influence People expressed that marketing departments um, are thoughtful about where to place their ads. So he shared, for example, um, an ad for life insurance would do really well if they place it um, during a commercial for the show Grey's Anatomy, which is a show that takes place in a hospital about doc doctors. And so you'll have more success for an ad for life insurance if it's placed correctly within a show that makes you think about um, life being fragile, like a show that takes place in a hospital. So there's priming there that that helps um, the marketing strategy. Okay, so applying this to, of course, conflict resolution. So when you're talking, um, listening and reframing, and you want to use words that are associated with motivations that you want to encourage. So use words in your remarks. Um, that you would like your listener to be primed for. So for example, words like fairness, balance, generosity, cooperation, and honesty. So consider, and then consider minimizing the use of other competitive or cold words, just litigation side, defiant, win, tough, not fair. Um, so an example might be using positive words like, thank you all for your cooperation today. I appreciate your honest effort and your compassionate communication. Um, we can get this meeting started. So that is a way to prime people for those types of um, communication styles. All right, so foot in the door. Since you've already, this is basically a technique, a compliance technique, where you ask for a small request and then you ask for something larger. So in a study, a participants, participants were asked to sign a petition before asking to make a donation to an organization. So the control group was not. The, the, they found that those that were asked to sign the petition were more likely to make a donation and actually resulted in more money being donated than the control group. So. Another example of this might be asking a friend to help you move some furniture, and then when they're there, asking them to help you clean out your garage. Door in the face is the very opposite technique. It's where you ask for a large request first. They turn it down and reject it, and then you go in with a second request that is much smaller. So, um, for example, maybe you ask, would you mind donating $500 for our annual fundraiser? <clears throat> 
and someone might say, oh no, like that, that's too much. You say, I understand, would you donate $100 instead? So um, you can see where <clears throat> this might help the person feel like you're appeasing them or you're doing a favor to make things easier for them. Um, in your personal life, an example might be if, if you want to go camping for a week, but your family or significant other doesn't like travel, you can ask your partner maybe for a larger request like, hey, let's do you want to take three weeks off of work and go backpack through Europe? And when they say no, then you say, all right, that, that's OK. What about maybe taking a week and and going on a road trip and go camping? So just a little cartoon for you on foot in the door. Hello, sir. Would you have two dollars for a bus ticket? <coughs> it's usually not going to get such a great response. The opposite would be, um, you know, asking somebody if they have the time, and then they say yes, and they give you the time, and you say thank you, and then you say, you know, um, I think I'm two dollars short for the bus. Could you help me a bit? And the other person is probably going to be more likely to comply because they've already said yes to a smaller request. So door in the face is the opposite, same type of cartoon. Blob, green blob is asking pink blob out and says, do you want to have dinner with me? And she's like, I don't think so. At least would you consider having coffee? Come on, it's not like we're getting dinner. And she's going to be more likely perhaps to say okay. Eileen? Yes. Hi, I'm sorry. Your sound is cutting in and out right now. Oh, I'm not doing anything. I'm not sure why that is. Is there something you suggest that I do? Um, it could possibly be, unfortunately, um, the internet connection is kind of going in and out a little bit. That's the only thing I could think. Okay. Um, do you think you might might be able to try to call in? Uh, I can. I I have one more slide, really. Would you like me to call in, or what are your thoughts? Probably because it's really hard to hear you right now at all. Okay, I, I will. I'm I sorry. Will that. Oh, that's okay. Um, okay. Let me do that. Yeah, no, Debbie, I, 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 the same way. I'm calling in from my phone, and I'm having issues. I think it's probably um, from... Eileen's end right now. So I think if she calls in, because she's calling on her computer right now. And I'm sorry, everybody. We just want to make sure you hear the end of it. And if there's any questions while Eileen's getting called in, please feel free to type those into the chat. Um, so we'll make sure to get to some of those. Hey, Robin? Yeah, is that Eileen? Yes, can you hear me? You're still cutting in and out. Okay, so I muted my computer. Can you hear me better now? Yes, now you're perfect. Okay, I'm hearing a kickback echo of myself, but since it's on the uh, webinar. What you need to do is, is you need to mute your um, computer. I'm, and yeah, you turn the volume down, but you need to mute it too. Okay. There you go. I'm sorry. Okay, I think we're back. We're ready, right? <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. Okay, sorry everybody. I hope you guys I hope I wasn't cutting in and out for too long. Um, no, okay, it wasn't. So, it was about a slide or so. Okay, good. Um, okay, so I only have just like two more slides. Um, so uh, lastly, um, the contrast effect, I think, is the last one. Yep, I haven't talked about that one yet. So this is where presenting different options causes people to compare based on those options. So if you look at this little small picture of um, circles to the right, if I were to ask you which of the inner orange circle looks bigger, most people would say the one on the right. Um, but the reality is, is that both those circles are the exact same size, and they just look different because of the contrasting effect. So another example of this might be a person um, might appear more or less attractive depending on who they are standing next to versus when, they, when that person is in isolation. 
So relating this to kind of the nonprofit world for perhaps donations or subscriptions, for example, most likely if we, you know, most likely no one will choose option B. People more likely pick option C because by comparison it appears to be a better deal. So you can think about how you can use this um, strategy even with your kids in chores and rewards or negotiations at work, for example. Um, so lastly, the last skill set would be this kind of quote of be like everyone else. Um, it really appeases to the need to be popular, prestigious, or similar to others. So an example might be simply saying things such as, you know, 75% of the people we ask to donate do, and 80% give more than $75 is just an example. Um, another one might be saying 85% of our volunteers commit to 10 hours a week, and 80% of them end up staying with us for X amount of time because they love the work. Would you be interested in learning more about volunteering at our nonprofit? So these are just some additional strategies to, um, to help with negotiations or marketing or conflict resolution. We've kind of gone through a lot of the different um, pieces of conflict resolution that we could possibly do in an hour's time. So we'll close on this, which says, peace does not mean an absence of conflict. Differences will always be there. Peace means solving these differences through peaceful means, through dialogue, education, knowledge, and through humane ways. So I guess the one thing I, I hope that you guys take away from this is conflict resolution um, is really a skill set that we're not born with <laughs> necessarily, and we do need to practice and be aware and take the time to um, perfect the skill set. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that people might have, Robin, if you want to um, help pass those along. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, I will let everybody go ahead and make some closing comments. Let everybody go ahead if you do have any questions to please feel free to type those in. Um, as I mentioned, I should by tomorrow morning have the slides and the recording ready and I will email those to everybody. Um, and while I'm doing these closing comments, one question we just got, Eileen, if you could mention again the website URL for the self-assessment you mentioned. For the, oh yes, um, let me go back. I can. I'm going to try and find it for you and tell you what it is because I think clicking back on these slides might think a little bit. Perfect. So it's, and while you're um, doing. Oh. oh, I've got it. So it's crucialconversations.com backslash exclusive. CrucialConversations.com backslash exclusive. Oh, there you Thank go. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> I went ahead and typed it in chat as you were saying it, so perfect. Um, again, please feel free if you have some questions to type those in. I do want to make sure and mention that we are going to have one more session in this series coming up probably in about six weeks or so, so definitely watch for that. Um, I do want to say thank you so much to everybody for attending today and taking your time to be here, and a huge thank you to Eileen. These sessions are always so insightful and so interesting, and I learn so much, so I appreciate it. I do want to say, too, I don't know if Kelly wants to jump on at all um, before we close things down. I think she's well, – oh, there she is. Yeah, I am here, um, but I think you pretty much said everything, Robin, that you know this has been a really – kind of a, a different type of webinar series that, you know, GFAS is trying out with, you know, typically we're a little more on the animal care or kind of more on the um, more, you know, operations and governance type of issues. So so this is a little bit of a, a different turn for us. And so, you know, any kind of feedback you feel um, about, you know, this kind of, of resource, we'd be happy to hear from you, whether, you know, helpful or it's not helpful. Those both would be, you know, useful to us. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Eileen. I, I really enjoyed the presentation and I'm looking forward to, as Robin said, the third 
in the series of three. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Well, I will go ahead um, and just mention one more time, I will send out the link to the recording tomorrow. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Diane. I can't wait to the third one. You're very welcome, and I would love if anybody has feedback to send your way. Um, I can always kind of make adjustments and things for people's needs, so that would be helpful. That's perfect. Yeah. That's great. Feel free to email me, everybody. You can definitely respond to me when I email with the link to the recording tomorrow, and I will pass it along. So thank you again, everybody, you. and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Bye.